I'm Stephen Monsbach, the president of the Association of Members of the Institute for Advanced Study. And in the name of all the membership, I welcome you to today's two lectures. This is a custom we have twice a year at our uh, semi-annual meetings. But generally, we reserve the two lectures for the November gathering to reward you doubly for your effort in coming here. But the reward is not just in doubleness, it's in the quality of today's two talks. Each is dealing with new universes for us. The first talk will deal with the universe of the past being brought to the present. The second talk will move us into a broader universe in the worlds beyond. Our first speaker, Joan Breton Connolly, is a distinguished scholar in class of classics in archaeology, a person who is as accomplished in the classroom and the library as she has made signal achievements in excavating throughout the Near East, in particular in Cyprus. For years, she's been engaged with Athens, and in particular, the perhaps perhaps one of the greatest monuments of the Western tradition, the Parthenon. As early as 1996, she wrote a signal article, Parthenon and Parthenoi, which served as a point of departure for a major book which has garnered tremendous attention and numerous positive reviews, and that will be in part her subject today. A field archeologist who's worked in Corinth, Athens, in on Paphos, Kurian, and many other places. She also has the distinction of having been awarded many um, distinguished honors in, gosh, there's so many one can barely mention, but of course one that certainly needs to be acknowledged is she is a MacArthur Fellow, which is an acknowledgement that her achievements go beyond any single field. Today, we're privileged in hearing her speak to us on the Parthenon, revealing aspects that have hitherto not been noted and carry tremendous significance, not just for classics, for the history of art, but for the history and culture that's the Western tradition. Joan. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you to Amias for the kind invitation to speak to you this afternoon. Round about 440 BC, when the astonishing temple you see before you, the Parthenon, was still under construction, the historian Herodotus wrote a famous account of a meeting between King Croesus of Lydia, the richest man in the world just over a century earlier, and that renowned Athenian lawgiver, Solon. Receiving Solon at his lavish palace in Sardis, Croesus asks the sage to tell him just who was the happiest man he had ever met in his long life and wide travels. Solon disappoints the super rich king who is expecting to be that man himself. Instead, Solon recounts the story of Tellus the Athenian, whose children were both beautiful and good, who lived to see the birth of his grandchildren, and who came to a most glorious end, dying bravely in battle, giving his life in defense of Athens in its war against Eleusis. For his ultimate sacrifice, Tellus was commemorated with public burial and honors. The values expressed in Herodotus's sketch of the ideal and happiest Athenian, one who enjoys eudaimonia, a state of highest human good in which all is well with the spirits, what we might call human flourishing today, are completely in sync with the messaging of the sculptures that decorate this, Athens' most iconic monument, the Parthenon. Since the time the Parthenon was built nearly 2,500 years ago, it has meant many things to many people as temple, church, mosque, ruin, and icon. From the Enlightenment on, it has come to represent the paragon of excellence in architecture, design, proportion, harmony, 
as well as the pinnacle in aesthetic beauty in the carving of its sculpture decoration. Above all, it has become the very symbol of democracy itself, a receptacle into which we have poured all that we think it means to be civilized. Like so many icons, the Parthenon suffers from what I like to call the magnet and mirror syndrome. The object of beauty drives us, draws us to it, and once there, we wish to see ourselves in it and appropriate it in our own terms. In looking at the Parthenon, Western culture inevitably sees itself. Indeed, it sees only what flatters its own self-image or explains it through connection to the birthplace of democracy. In this process, the building's original meaning becomes very much obscured. This afternoon, I'd like to ask the question, what did the Parthenon mean to those who built it and who worshipped at it for nearly 900 years? To answer this, we will take the long view across imagined eons of time and endeavor to see the Parthenon through ancient eyes. This long view enables us to recognize the power of genealogical myth in shaping the stories that are carved in stone and projected onto the great billboards of the Acropolis temple pediments, metopes, and friezes from the archaic period on. This reveals the centrality of succession myth in constructing and perpetuating local memory and identity. Why is this so important? As Plato himself tells us, the stories we tell our children when they are young, through words and through pictures, shape their souls, influencing who they become in maturity. Myths and legends must therefore be very carefully selected the permanence and conspicuousness of architectural sculpture makes it the perfect platform through which the community's values can be transmitted intact, generation upon generation. But seeing the Parthenon through ancient eyes is especially difficult for us since we are surrounded by Parthenonian imagery in our lives today. From the late 18th century on, the Greek Revival movement, particularly robust here in America, uh, gives us the form of the Parthenon here, the Second Bank of the United States in Philadelphia of 1816, the U.S. Patent Office, now part of the Smithsonian Museum in Washington of the 1830s, San Francisco's Old Mint, and every day those walking on Wall Street pass the Parthenon in the form of Federal Hall, the old U.S. Custom House. Such government buildings, our banks, libraries, post offices, courts, and custom houses, use Parthenonian architectural form in order to communicate a set of values, implicitly aligning themselves with the flowering of democratic Athens, thus invoking a sense of security, stability, dependability, your money is good here and safe. But in each of these cases, what is fundamentally a religious form of architecture has been appropriated for a purely secular function. The familiarity of the Parthenon in our civic orbit has further distanced us from its original role as a deeply sacred space. And here I think it's useful to reflect that the Parthenon is as far behind us in time as the year 4475 is in front of us. Now that somehow feels a lot farther away, doesn't it? <laughs> we can't imagine that the people living in 4475 will be anything like us. So why should we expect to see ourselves in the Parthenon, in the figures marching on Parthenon freeze. What if the ancient reality was profoundly different from what we have projected upon it? What if it is a reality that takes us out of our comfort zone? In fact, from the Enlightenment on, much of what we know of the Parthenon has to do with its reception 
projection and appropriation by us. What I'd like to do is to try to engage with an ancient reality that has to do with values, memory, and identity. And I'd like to start at ground level, from the very landscape from which the Acropolis emerges. For it is these springs and caves and streams and trees that gave birth to the myths and legends through which the Athenians came to understand their origins. By looking to an inventive, invented and very remote past, they attempted to explain how things came to be as they are. It is here amongst the, amongst the caves of the north slope of the Acropolis that they imagined their earliest ancestors were conceived and lived out the dramas of distant myths and died heroically. And they turned their eyes heavenwards as well to take in the cosmos, to try to understand how it all began, conjuring up tales of primordial clashes between celestial powers fought out at the very dawn of time. The Greeks comprehended their distant past according to certain fixed boundary catastrophes that punctuated and divided time into distinct eras, marking the succession of one period by another. Cosmic wars are among the earliest of these, the celestial battles of remote antiquity that set a new generation against an earlier one in that universal struggle of nature and the cosmos. As with age-old narratives in the ancient Near East, these earliest clashes were between earth and sky gods. In time, their children, the Titans, came to do battle with their children, the Olympians, in what we call the Titanomachy. The triumphant Olympians, in turn, go on to fight the giants of their own generation in the Gigantomachy. A second type of boundary event is inundation. The recurrence of great floods divides times into eras, the division between the antediluvian and the diluvian being as important to the Greeks as it was to the Sumerian, Akkadian, and Hebrew traditions. Floods mark the ultimate before and after, a transformed relationship between gods and man, a point from which the present age can claim descent. At Athens, the earliest deluge was regarded to be that of Ogeechee's time, followed by the flood of King Deucalion, and later, a flood during the reign of King Kekrops. We have such division into time according to boundary catastrophes in our own day. We speak of the post-Katrina era. There are, uh, locally, people think in terms of the tsunami that happened here before and after to this day. And similarly, we speak of the World War II period. And our final category is that of epic war. Those that took place in the heroic period coming down in time. And among these, the earliest, the battles of a new hero, Theseus who fights in the battle with the Amazons and the centaurs, the Amazonomachy and Centauromachy. Coming down in time, we have the Trojan War, that greatest of all boundary events that marks the division between mythic and truly historical time. A war to which an Athenian king, Erechtheus, sent ships, as recorded in the Iliad Book Two. And at Athens, the final great local clash of the heroic era was the war between King Erechtheus of Athens against Eumolpus, the champion of Eleusis, the very same place that our happy Tellus died fighting against many centuries later. It is within this system that we should approach the Acropolis, and our understanding of the Parthenon. How many of you think first and foremost when you see the Parthenon, think of it as a replacement building? Because this is how the ancient Athenians would have seen it. It is the building that went up on their ground zero 
30 years after the Persians burned its predecessor to the ground. In order to understand the sculptural program of the Parthenon, we have to go back many generations and look at what was on its same site. In the early part of the 6th century BC, round about 580, the first great stone temple was built on the Acropolis on the site that would be later occupied by the Parthenon. Now, we don't have its foundations because of later building on this spot, but we do have some of its sculptural decoration made in beautiful porous limestone, a lion and lioness at center attacking a calf, and in the wings we have Zeus fighting a three-bodied monster with snaky tail on the right, and his son Heracles fighting another snaky-tailed monster, Triton, at the left. And so we have father and son, subsequent generations, fighting monsters. Each generation must pick up the task and slay the dragon itself. And this particular dragon is in the form of Typhon, the last son of Gaia and Tartarus, the father of all monsters. You see Zeus going at him with his thunderbolt and his Chalcedy and Hydra um, at the left. And you see this monster begging for mercy, supplicating, asking Zeus to spare him, which he will not. When we turn to Zeus's son, Heracles, something interesting begins to happen. In addition to this giant stone temple, what we call the Hecatompodon, or hundred footer, there are smaller pediments from smaller buildings, and the one I show you at bottom shows once again the son of Heracles there, the son of Zeus, Heracles, there, fighting the Hydra, the Lernaean Hydra, with a million snaky heads, and each time you cut off one, they grow back tenfold again. But what you may not have ever realized is that the Lernaean Hydra is the daughter of Typhon. And so it is generational. The monsters against the heroes, generation upon generation, we will see the same configuration when we get to the Parthenon itself. We see our Hecatompodon there at upper right. It was joined by another great stone temple on the Acropolis at the very end of the 6th century, a building we call the Old Athena Temple at lower left. This was built after Cleisthenes brings in the new democracy in 508 BC. And side by side, we would have had a building from nearly 100 years earlier, the Hecatompodon showing cosmic battles, an earlier level. Zeus against Typhon. And what did the old Athena temple show? It comes down a generation, and we have the Gigantomachy, the Olympian gods fighting against the giants of their own generation. In time, the building at right is replaced. Hard to know why. Perhaps it was too associated with the tyranny of Pisistratus, and the new democracy wanted its own great building. And here you see it, just here, the foundations for the father of the Parthenon, the building that was under construction in 480 BC. You see it side by side with the old Athena temple of the new democracy. Now, it was built up to the third column drum with scaffolding all around on that fateful day in 480 BC when the unthinkable happened. The Persian army attacked and burned the Acropolis to the ground. The Greeks had an unwritten rule that in times of warfare, you always respected the holy places of your enemy. So they knew the sack would be serious, but they never dreamt. It came as a total surprise to see their Acropolis and most sacred shrines burned. Most Athenians had evacuated to the safety of the island of Salamis and watched the smoke rise from the Acropolis from this distance. And here, I like to think about the teenagers of 480 BC. 
Pericles on the left was about 15 years old. Of course, he would grow up to become the great, greatest general and a politician and leader of Athens by the mid-century. And he would become a very close friend of Sophocles, who we know was 16 years old in 480 BC, as he was chosen some months later when the Athenians reversed their losses to defeat the Persian fleet at Salamis, it was Sophocles that was chosen to lead the victory dance. He was already something of a dance captain, charismatic it boy around town. He would go on in performance to become one of the greatest playwrights of all time. And I like to ask myself, was it the trauma suffered at the tender age of 15 and 16 that pushed this group of men to forge what can really be called the greatest generation, not just politicians and uh, generals and playwrights, but philosophers, architects, artists, the full flowering of mathematics and science, everything that comes in what we call the golden age of Athens was forged by those who were teenagers on that terrible day. Now, they didn't rebuild the, Parth the Acropolis for 30 years. They left it as a smoking embered ruin. Why? Well, in the days before media, before film or television, how do you prove that something happened? How do you document it if you clean it all up and no one can see it? And it is thought that the Athenians were concerned that if they cleaned it up, people might forget what had happened, or worse yet, not believe that it had happened. But in 447 BC, we see the start of a new building program on the Acropolis under Pericles himself. And I like to think that these men, as they came into maturity, wanted to leave their children and grandchildren something better than a burned out ground zero. They had the distant memory that when they were young, the Acropolis was a place of hope and energy and building and a new temple was going up. And they wanted, before they died, to pass on something like that to future generations. But as they cleaned up, they gathered carefully those relics from the old temples, and they reconstituted those column drums that set one upon the other of the old Parthenon, the father of the Parthenon. They didn't just throw them into the northern fortification wall. They reconstituted them as they were that day as a memorial display, lest anyone forget. And what a successful memorial it is, because to this day you can look up and see those column drums in the north wall of the Acropolis. Here they are, just here. And a little further down the north slope, here, we see the reconstituted triglyph metope frieze of the old Athena temple. They're lovingly put up. And here I think that we can maybe connect with the very human sensibilities, certainly those of us uh, who live in New York <laughs> and have followed the development of our own memorial at Ground Zero. The committees that worked on the design fought about almost everything, but on one point, everyone agreed that the footprints must be left unbuilt. That desire to say this is the place where those buildings were that went down that way. And similarly, by salvaging those uh, pieces of the old Athena temple and the father of the Parthenon and keeping them there, we tap into that human desire to commemorate and yet to move forward. The desire to remember and the desire to create something new. And when they created something new, they did it bigger and better than ever before. And so when they looked at their new Parthenon rising from the Acropolis, it was the phoenix rising from the ashes. The ashes, they saw this as a replacement building, as something that was ultimately going to be the best thank you gift to the goddess Athena, patroness of Athens, who had saved them from their terrible defeat. When they built the Parthenon, it would be bigger, better than ever before. It would have eight columns across the front and 17 down the sides, more than they'd ever tried before. 
it would be built entirely of pentelic marble from the mountain 10 miles to the northeast of Athens. Chauvinism kicks in, no imported marble, no Parian marble as some of the archaic temples had had. This would be Athenian from the roof tiles to the bottom step. And it would have more sculpture decoration than any temple ever had before. The two pediments would be filled with over 25 over life size figures showing characters, genealogical characters going way back in time, kings and royal families of Athens. And there would be 92 carved metopes running all the way around the temple. This had never been done before. And this would also tell tales of Athenian heroes, a genealogical narrative. In fact, the sculptural program is like a family portrait, even a family tree that takes you through generation upon generation going ever back into the more distant past. And this is where we can again understand the Plato coming in. These myths and legends are part of Paideia. It is the education of the young who generation after generation look up at this family tree, no doubt pointed out to them by parents who bring them up here, and they learn who they are and where they come from. In fact, the east pediment starts at the very beginning with the birth of Athena, and the west pediment, I could like to call it the birth of Athens itself, for here we have the contest of Poseidon and Athena for patronage of the city. The east pediment, I show you at top a drawing from 1674 by the uh, artistic team of the Marquis de Montel just before, 11 years before it was exploded further by cannon fire of the Venetians. So we don't have the scene at dead center that would have shown the birth of Athena, and as you all know, she had an unusual birth, popping full grown out of the head of Zeus. The west side shows Athena in combat with the god Poseidon, over who will become the patron of Athens. And of course, Athena wins. So at the center of the composition, we have the great god and goddess going at it. But fascinatingly, as we go down the slopes to either side, behind Athena, we have characters from the royal house of Athens, King Cecrops and his three daughters at the left, and behind Poseidon and going down to the right, we have the royal house of Eleusis, the same Eleusis that Tellus fought against. Poseidon's son Eumolpus goes on to become a great champion of Eleusis. And both of these royal families, interestingly, have three daughters. And both of these sets of three daughters, interestingly, adopt a foundling child, Erichthonius at Athens and Triptolemus. And so we begin to understand the genealogy of us and our enemies together. And if we go to the very wings of the West Pediment, what do we find? The personifications of the rivers and springs of Athens. The Cephissus and Eridnus River at the left here, and the Calaroe Spring and the Elysis at the right. And you may say, yes, this is to set the scene at Athens. But even more, these rivers are part of a genealogical program. That is the Cephissus River itself, the largest and greatest river of Athens, gives birth to a naiad nymph named Praxitheia, who marries King Erechtheus. And it is this queen, Praxitheia, and it is her three daughters, the grandchildren of the river itself, who will play such an important role on the Parthenon frieze. Turning to those metopes again, we come down in time, later than the contest for Athens, later than King Cecrops, we are now, um, well, in the period of Theseus. And on the south side, we have the battle of the Greeks and the centaurs in which Theseus took place. And on the west, we have Theseus and the Amazonomachy. On the north side that is out of view, we have the fall of Troy, the Trojan War to which King Erechtheus, the only Athenian king mentioned by Homer in the Iliad, he sent ships. And that is the latest point in the Metopes, the East Metopes showing the Gigantomachy. The, 
cosmic battle. So early on the east, getting later on the west and south, and later yet on the north. But it is the Parthenon frieze, 525 feet of carved decoration that I believe gives us the Athenians' fullest expression of their own self-awareness. You are probably all um, recognize the famous cavalcade of horsemen following behind the charioteers. Now, we are at a disadvantage here because we have no ancient author that speaks of what the Athenians saw in these images. In fact, the Roman writer, uh, the uh, Roman author Pausanias of Roman times, he talks about the statue of Athena inside the Parthenon and he talks about the pediments, but he does not mention the frieze. We have to wait all the way to the 15th century before we have a surviving commentary on the frieze, and this by Siriacos of Ancona, an Italian merchant and man of letters. Now, Siriacos writes letters home in 1444, and he says, on the Parthenon frieze, we see the army of Pericles' day. This is the first pronouncement of the Parthenon frieze as an image of historical time, the moment of which it was first carved. We have some problems here already, because what do we see? We see chariots, and the chariot went out of use in Athenian warfare at the end of the Bronze Age, around 1200 BC. So this cannot be an army of Pericles' day. And we see a great cavalry, which was also not a major component of the army in Pericles' day. More worrying yet, the pride and joy of Pericles' army was the hoplite force, the infantry, nowhere to be seen on the Parthenon frieze. And yet, Syriacos of Ancona is perhaps a good suggestion for his time. His contention that this is a historical event has rarely been questioned ever since. The cavalry follows behind those who play musical instruments. You see pipe players and lyre players down below. They follow behind those carrying offerings for sacrifice, big water jugs, metal hydriae on the right, and on the left, men carrying metal trays. They all follow behind animals being brought to sacrifice, and the whole procession moves from the west to the east end of the temple and culminates at this central scene right above the door where we get five figures, a woman at dead center, two adolescent girls to the left of her, a man behind her, and a child further on. And in the handbooks, we read that this scene is identified as the enigmatic peplos incident. The great culmination of 520 feet of marching parade culminating in something that we are not sure what it is. Enigmatic. Now, it all hinges on that piece of cloth, which we call a peplos. And we really have to go now to the 18th century and these two gentlemen who first put this idea forward. We have um, at two English gentlemen travelers, architect and amateur architect, I would say, and artist, James Stewart and Nicholas Rivette. They went out to Athens in the 1750s and made drawings and descriptions of the Parthenon and published in four luscious, beautiful volumes uh, their findings in the Antiquities of Athens. In their volume two of 1787, they throw out a gentle question. They say, could this fabric represent the peplos of Athena? They were learned men. It was a good guess. They knew that the peplos of Athena was presented to her annually at her Panathenaic festival. Now, the word peplos in Greek can mean many things. It actually means just a square, woolen cut of cloth. It can be used for the word dress. It can also be used for the word swaddling clothes, awning, sunshade, sail on a ship, or funerary shroud. But 
We know Athena was given a peplos, and theirs was a good idea for their day. They were learned men. But were this true, the Parthenon would stand outside of all other Greek temple decoration, which always takes its subject matter not from reality, but from myth. As I've shown you, the pediment shows scenes from myth, the metope shows scenes from myth. Why would the frieze step out of this mythological program to suddenly show you today, reality, a kind of Periclean selfie? This is a foreign concept within the parameters of the use of images. And over time, this w gentle question of Stuart Rivette solidified into hardened dogma, almost never questioned in the past 230 years. And more and more in the handbooks, we begin to see a projection onto this Panathenaic procession, again, that says more about us than it does about the ancient Greeks. Very often, it is portrayed as a kind of Fourth of July parade, a civic procession, the body politic all marching along, with the culmination being a new birthday dress for the goddess, which is not a very ancient Greek concept. What's missing here is religion, and it is a religious festival. And the ritual of the Panathenaea cannot exist without a mythological foundation, and we have not had much discussion about looking at the myth behind the practice. So this is what I take on in the book, The Parthenon Enigma, which I'm very proud to say I did most of the research for here at the Institute four years ago. I'm very uh, thankful for that. And in this book, I look at the two things, the two powerful forces that change the way we understand the ancient world. First of all, the discovery of new data, and secondly, the development of new methodological frameworks and questions that we ask of that data. Both exist for this subject. And then, leaving the 15th and the 18th century ideas behind, I try to employ methods of the 21st century, looking at this material through the lens of the archaeology of the landscape, of memory, of ritual, of emotion, anthropological approaches, human values, political theory, what values underpin the very first democracy. And presenting this um, new data, which is, in fact, is not all that new. It's been around since 1901 or 1902. It was excavated then, um, miles away in the Fayum Oasis in Egypt by Pierre Juguet, French archaeologist. He found dozens and dozens of mummies dating to the third century BC, the, the Hellenistic period. He brought them back to Paris, where they stayed at the Institut de Papyrologie until the 1960s. And it was only then that these uh, paper mache mummies, which is what they are, constructed of discarded pieces of papyri that the scribes had made an error. And they threw them in the recycle bin. The recycled papyri went to the morticians who randomly put them together and created cheap mummy casings for average people of the Hellenistic period. And so these mummy casings become our best source of lost Greek text, new Greek text, text we didn't know about. And it was in the 1960s that um, Professor uh, André Bataille developed the method for peeling them apart. And it is this um, papyrus that you see here um, that contains a very important text by Euripides, a play called the Erechtheus after the king of Athens. And this, this text gives us 150 new lines of a play that we knew existed, and from many, many multiple other sources, we had about 130 lines. So we come for around 250 plus lines of this play, enough to give us a sense of its storyline. This was big news in 1963. Life magazine ran a full glossy spread on it, if only today, 
new breakthroughs in papyrology could get such coverage. Um, the play tells us the story of King Erechtheus when the first outside threat comes to Athens. It is Eumolpus, the son of Poseidon, still angry that he lost the contest with Athena. And so the son comes to try to take Athens back for their side. And he brings a mercenary army of Thracians, and they're surrounding the Acropolis. Erechtheus goes to the Delphic Oracle and says, how can I save my city? And the answer is dark. You must sacrifice your daughter. And he goes back and tells his wife, Queen Praxithea, the daughter of the Cephissus River, and says, what shall we do? And Praxithea answers in one of the most powerful and civic-minded speeches in all of Greek drama. She says, of course I will give my daughter to save the city. No one family should put itself above the common good. If I had sons, wouldn't I send them into battle? I have no sons. I have three daughters. I will give one so that my people can live. The girl is sacrificed. The battle ensues. As promised by the oracle, the Athenians are victorious. But two unexpected consequences occur. Erechtheus himself is killed in the battle. And the two older sisters of the girl, they had made a secret pact that if one died, the others would throw themselves off the Acropolis in a suicide pact. And they do. And so at the end of this play, in the speech that we have preserved on the new papyrus, Athena appears to Praxithea, who is standing alone in the middle of the citadel, and she says to her, bury your three daughters together in a common tomb and build a precinct to them. And bury your husband in the middle of the Acropolis and build a precinct to him. And I will make you my priestess. You will look after both spaces, and you will oversee ritual here, and only you can make burnt sacrifice at my altar. What happens when we look at the two temples that stand to this day on the Acropolis? The one at the left, it's called the Erechtheion, the one with the caryatid porch, right? It means the place of Erechtheus. And next to it, the Parthenon. And what does that mean? It means the place of the maidens, plural. It is a plurality of maidens. It's very simple. I believe that the Athenians perceived the tomb of the maidens to rest beneath the Parthenon and the tomb of Erechtheus to, march, to rest beneath the Erechtheion. And when we look at a ground plan of the Parthenon and the Erechtheion, we can see this. We know that it was the westernmost room of the Parthenon in inscriptions of the fifth century that referred to this space as the Parthenon. By the fourth century, it comes to mean the whole building, but I believe that the Athenians understood the tomb of the girls was beneath the westernmost room of this temple, just as we know they believed the tomb of Erechtheus was under the westernmost room of the Erechtheion. And this helps to explain an interesting historic reality, which is that these two temples shared a single altar and a single priestess. All other Greek temples have their own priest or priestess and their own altar. Why do they share? On the model of the foundation myth of Queen Praxithea, looking after the space of her husband and her children, both within temples to Athena. Should, be, should this be surprising that we have tombs in close proximity to temples? I think not. And if we just look sideways for a moment, I'll show you the situation at Olympia. There between the Temple of Zeus and the Temple of Hera, what do we find? The tomb of the great hero Pelops. And we turn to the Nemea, and here we have the Temple of Zeus. And what do we have nearby? The prince of Nemea, the baby boy, Opheltes, who was bitten by a snake and died in the sanctuary, his tomb just there. And then we go to Ismia and the temple of Poseidon. And what do we find beside it? Circled in red, the tomb of Melikertes Polymen, the little prince who drowned in the Saronic Gulf just off of the nearby shore. And if we go to Amiclai near Sparta, what do we find? The tomb of the prince Hyakinthos, the beloved of Apollo, 
buried underneath Apollo's statue within the temple. And so I almost think there would be an expectation that there should be the tombs of local heroes here on the Acropolis, because I believe that there is a very strong dynamic between heroic to tombs of local heroes and temples of local divinities. And so, when we turn to the Parthenon frieze, I think we're looking not, as has been said, based on 18th and 15th century interpretations, a, a historical priestess of Athena at the middle, a historical priest behind her, two temple servants carrying furniture, we don't know why, at the left, and a girl or boy with the peplos ready to present it to the goddess on her birthday. In fact, I believe it is a family portrait. I think it is what we would expect to see over the door of the temple. Praxithea at the center, her husband behind her dressed as a priest about to sacrifice the youngest daughter who is changing out of her daily clothes and about to put on her funerary dress. And on the left, we have the two older sisters, I believe, carrying on their heads their own funerary dresses, implicitly telling us that they are about to die as well. Girls in Greek tragedy who go to sacrifice dress in advance in their bridal clothes. And I believe that the cosmos, the dressing up, is an important signifier of the sacrifice that is about to occur. These two older sisters are holding stools. One of the chair legs is in low relief. This would have been doweled on and that set in that hole. This one too, this one would have been painted on. To our eyes, they do look like stools with cushions on them, but this doesn't mean that that's what they were because in antiquity, one used such low stools to carry fancy fabric, woven fabric, that had maybe taken a year to weave with precious purple dye and thread and gilding in the days before dry cleaning, you wouldn't carry this very precious and expensive fabric. You carried it on stools as this uh, vase painting of Ezekiel shows, a serving boy bringing a fresh mantle in. I believe that what we're looking at is a cosmos, the dressing up of the little girl for sacrifice, just as we see on this vase in the Louvre that shows the dressing up of a bride for her wedding day. The display of the dress about to be put on, key, and the serving maid bringing in a metal jewelry box with lion's paw feet for the decking out of the bride in jewelry. The girl at the furthest left is holding something in her hand, which, uh, Many commentators have remarked has lion's paw feet. I believe that is the jewelry box. We are looking towards the cosmos. And Aristides tells us that Praxithea, preparing the girl for sacrifice, dressed her up just as if she were sending her to a festival. And so I believe we're looking at the pre-battle sacrifice, the sphagia, which must take place before every battle. Here at the center, at the culminating moment, above the door, front door of the Parthenon. And so the gods sit either side of it, turning their backs and looking out at what I believe to be the thanksgiving sacrifice coming off the battle, the triumphant army of Erechtheus and all the offerings brought as the post-battle sacrifice, which is the first Panathenea, the Ur Panathenea, the reason we do it every year on the model of what was done here. And this helps explain why the gods turn their back on the frieze if Athena is receiving her peplos, why is she so indifferent? Why does she turn her back on her birthday gift? The body language would suggest she's rejecting the gift, actually. But we know from Greek tragedy that gods must not watch mortals die. They always avert their eyes. They always leave the house. When death is coming, the gods must not watch. It is polluting for them to look. I believe this works out very nicely. They look away to receive the thanksgiving sacrifice coming toward them. And as we move out from the gods to the flanks of the temple, what do we see? Cattle being brought to sacrifice. At the end of uh, her speech, Athena says to Praxithea, honor your husband Erechtheus annually with cattle sacrifice. And that is what we see before us. 
She then says, honor your daughters, not with wine libation, the normal liquid offering, but only a libation of honey and water, very specific. And what do we see juxtaposed on the frieze? Water bearers and tray carriers. Now, what is in the trays? Well, it's a little difficult to see. This slab is in the Acropolis Museum in Athens. You see the hydria bearers, and the tray bearer here is in the Vatican. But if we look inside, I think that we can see a texture here. We turn to a lexicographer, Photius. He tells us that the trays held honeycomb, a liquid offering of honey and water for the girls. I do not think that texture is inconsistent with the texture of honeycomb. I don't know how many of you have eaten it uh, just like that, but in my village in Cyprus, sometimes honeycomb is the only sweet on the menu for dessert. And, well, it works rather nicely. If we do have a honey and water offering so specific and unique to the speech of Athena saying this is what must be done for the girls just as cattle are for the father, I believe we are one step closer to understanding the imagery on the frieze. That would make the great army coming back, the heroic army coming off the battlefield behind the chariots, and let's not forget it was Erechtheus himself who introduced use of the chariot in to Athens. He brought the chariot in um, as a mode of warfare. And in the very northwest panel of the uh, uh, Parthenon frieze, we see this beautiful image. A little boy, an adolescent youth in a short tunic, a young Ephib on horseback, 18 years old, and a mature man who seems to beckon them forward, who seems to call them into the march, the march from childhood to maturity of the Athenian citizen. It is a kind of mirror in marble that reflects back the ideal citizen from childhood to maturity. His glory comes not from his individuality, not from the poetry or philosophy he makes, but in the fact of his being one of the many. It is the responsibility of Athens to educate him in the history, identity, and values into which he has been born. And in doing so, the polis provides the answer to that most compelling of all human questions, where do I come from? And the values that we see on the frieze are exactly the same values that motivated Tellus and made him an ideal citizen in dying in defense of his country. They are the same values that we hear out of the mouth of Queen Praxitheia again and again and again in this beautiful play of Euripides. Is it right for me to destroy all this city when it is possible for me to give one child to die on behalf of all? Is it not better that the whole be saved by one of us doing our part? And so when we come to that central scene, we can begin to understand how this is the last hurrah of the, of the legendary period. The Periclean building program did well to end with the story of Erechtheus. Erechtheus is the earliest founding father mentioned, the only king of Athens mentioned by Homer. He has been a sleeping hero all of these years. I believe that the Periclean program pulled him out of his sleep and catapulted him to fame. It is the way of these regimes to have a kind of poster boy a hero that the people can latch on to. So in the sixth century, the Pisistratid tyranny, it was Heracles. Then when Cleisthenes uh, brings in the new democracy, the hero of the moment is Theseus. And now with the new Parthenon, it's time for Erechtheus, our, the earliest founding father to be brought back. And why? Because this is no mere story. This is a representation of the core values of this society. That the very founding family of Athens, from whom all are descended, 
could not put itself above the common good speaks to a radical egalitarianism, not in circumstance, but in responsibility. The very antithesis of the barbarian sentiment that society exists for the exaltation of its most exalted members. Not far away is this thought. The Persian royal family ran away from the Battle of Salamis, left their fleet to founder. But the Athenian founders did not put themselves above the good, the common good, because at Athens everyone must be willing to sacrifice even the elites, even the royals, no exceptions, no one person is better than anyone else at Athens. And this, I believe, is the spiritual backbone of Athenian democracy. And this notion that sacrifice rests at the heart of democracy is exactly that so powerfully argued by Danielle Allen in her book, Talking to Strangers, Anxieties of Citizenship Since Brown versus the Board of Education. This is the notion that brought the lasting happiness to tell us. And this is what makes Athenians different from other people of their day. And this allowed the tender shoots of democracy to take root. Now many have said to me, you cannot put a scene of human sacrifice above the door of a temple. And I would say, well, our society doesn't seem to have a problem with it. At least in our own day, there is scarcely a Christian church that doesn't have a scene of human sacrifice above the door, and we do not recoil in horror and run away. But what about in the times of the Athenians themselves? Would this be acceptable? The best we can do is to go to the temple closest to it in time, that Temple of Zeus at Olympia, built just 20 years earlier. And what do we see here? It's very telling. We see on the east side, the main side again, the royal family in solemn lineup, standing, anticipating a tragic event, a murder, in fact. Pelops will cheat in the chariot race, Onomaus will die, and here on the left, the groom is pulling out the linchpin of the chariot wheel and putting in wax. A death is about to occur here, too. And what do we see? The royal family of Elis and Pisa, just as we have the royal family here. And I could show you many examples of other temples that show the genealogical portrait right there above the temple. I think there would be an expectation to find the Athenian royal family here. Now, why is it important that we try on a new paradigm, that we engage with this way of seeing and thinking? Well, for starters, it has a big impact on the ways in which we view the ancient Athenians. Many, many people think of the Athenians as people that would be very much at home in Berkeley, California, or Cambridge, Massachusetts, <laughs> spending their days in luminous contemplation of truth and beauty and science and philosophy. And to be sure, there were many Athenians doing exactly that. But even those were deeply spiritual people, God-fearing people, people who spent much of their day asking and thanking and trying to keep things right with the gods, worrying about eudaimonia, even the Rationalist Pericles, when dying of the plague, tied lots of amulets on his person, trying to keep death off. It's also important to engage with this deeper thought. What is democracy, and what is the role of sacrifice within it? All democracies ever since have been much about keeping that balance right. What is the obligation of the community to the individual? And what is the individual's responsibility to the community? In ancient Athens, the emphasis fell solidly on the latter. No citizen would put himself above the common good. I believe if we engage with this paradigm, if we put aside parades and birthday dresses and engage with values and paideia, and teaching the next generation who they are and what they should value most, we may just discover that the Parthenon is even more beautiful than we ever realized before.
Thank you.